Good morning, welcome to Breakfast with Louise Minchin and Dan Walker. Our headlines for you at six o'clock. As a big coronavirus vaccine breakthrough provides hope, Boris Johnson urges caution. We've cleared one significant hurdle, but there are several more to go before we know the vaccine can be used. A warning that some young children in England have forgotten how to use a knife and fork during the pandemic. More Brexit defeat for the government as the House of Lords kicks out their plan to protect UK trade. Good morning. The under 25s caught in a catch 22. The latest unemployment figures are set to show more job losses. Younger people continue to be hit hardest, struggling to find work without the right experience. The prospect of a coronavirus vaccine brings renewed hope that fans might return to watch live sport. For now, the government says there isn't a timescale on getting spectators back into stadiums. Good morning. Today we're starting with a lot of clouds, some mist and some fog and some showers. But most of that should give way to some sunshine and a drier afternoon. But I'll have all the details in 10 minutes. Very good morning. It's a Tuesday, the 10th of November. Our top story for you, millions of doses of a highly effective new vaccine could be in use in the UK by the end of this year. But the Prime Minister has warned against any easing of social distancing measures for the time being. The pharmaceutical firms Pfizer and BioNTech, uh, I think that's it, is that BioNTech, isn't it? That's right. Have said their vaccine, which is not yet licensed, appears to protect nine in ten people from COVID-19. John McManus has the details. Is it a game changer or is it too early to be optimistic? The announcement by Pfizer yesterday was greeted with almost jubilation. After a year in which 50 million people worldwide have been infected and in which more than 1.2 million have died, it's easy to see why so many view this vaccine as an answer to their prayers. It's believed to be more than 90% effective and the government has ordered 40 million doses, enough to immunise 20 million people who'll need two jabs each. But one person urging caution is the Prime Minister. We've talked for a long time, or I have, about the distant bugle of the scientific cavalry uh, coming over the brow of the hill. I can tell you that tonight that toot of that bugle is louder, but it's still some way off. But the odds have now changed, according to England's deputy chief medical officer. So this is like, um, you know, getting to the end of a playoff final. It's gone to penalties. The first player goes up, scores the goal. You haven't won the cup yet, but what it does is it tells you that the goalkeeper can be beaten. And that's where we are today, that first sign. Thank you. I'm Penalty shootouts don't always inspire confidence and there are other challenges to overcome. The vaccine's safety needs to be assured before it gets regulatory approval. Pfizer has indicated it will apply for this in the US later this month. It's still not known just how long any immunity might last for. And decisions need to be made about who can have it first, with care home residents and workers likely to be at the top of the list. If it emerges that the vaccine needs to be taken annually, then an information campaign similar to the one for seasonal flu jabs will have to be rolled out and it will need to tackle any misinformation. A limited number of people may get the vaccine this year, but for everybody else, the advice remains the same. Face masks, hand washing and social distancing are still the best protection. John McManus, BBC News. We will bring you uh, plenty of reaction to this potential vaccine throughout the programme today. At half past seven, we'll be speaking to the Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, live on Breakfast. We will. Uh, Donald Trump has accused Pfizer of not having the courage to make its announcement about the vaccine before the election. He claims the news was delayed to prevent him getting a vaccine win before polls opened last week. Uh, let's get more from our North America correspondent, David Willis. Uh, David, uh, good morning to you. Uh, give us a run through what exactly the president has been saying then. Well, Donald Trump hasn't been seen in public down for five days, which is uh, highly unusual for him, apart from a couple of rounds of golf over the weekend. But he's been in the White House, locked up with his advisers, uh, devising a legal strategy and tweeting up a storm. And uh, he's been tweeting about allegations of voter fraud in the election, claiming 
again, that uh, the result was snatched from him. And he's also taken aim at Pfizer and the U.S. regulatory agency, the Food and Drug Administration, um, saying that uh, they should have made this announcement about a vaccine earlier in the interest of saving lives. Uh, he said the U.S. FDA and the Democrats didn't want to have me get a vaccine win prior to the election, so instead it came out five days later, as I've said all along. Now, uh, President Trump continually stressed during the election campaign that a vaccine was just around the corner, uh, but he wasn't able to point to anything specific, of course, and uh, the very fact that uh, this announcement has come from Pfizer just uh, less than a week after the presidential election is clearly a source of intense irritation to President Trump right now, Dan. And there's also been um, a, a lawsuit, hasn't there, against the state of Pennsylvania? That's right. Indeed, the uh, Trump campaign has filed lawsuits in a number of the key battleground states looking to have uh, basically the results uh, thrown out there. And um, there are these legal challenges which are likely to drag on for several weeks, potentially disrupting the transition process. But uh, legal experts are saying that despite that, they see very little chance of them actually succeeding. It's really, they say, just a way of Donald Trump saving face. OK, David, thank you very much. That's uh, the latest from Los Angeles for you this morning. Uh, news back here. Nottinghamshire could be the next region in England to trial mass testing after the scheme first began in Liverpool last week. And the mayor of Liverpool says more than 20,000 people in the city have already been tested as part of the pilot. Our reporter, Mairead Smith, is at a test centre outside Anfield Stadium for there this morning. And there's been a big uptake of this, hasn't there? Morning. Good morning to you. Yes, there has been a big uptick. Today is day five of this pilot. It's expected to last at least 10 days. Apparently, there is some room for manoeuvre on that, it's especially with this news that it will be rolled out to other local authorities as well. We're waiting for a bit more information on that. It's reported that Nottingham could be the next city to get this pilot. Do you remember a few weeks back when Tier 3 was what we were talking about? Liverpool was right up there with high rates of infection, Nottingham as well. So this is really about targeting those areas and this city of Liverpool was first to ask for this pilot, these lateral flow tests that were explained in last night's briefing when the Prime Minister and Brigadier Fossey talked about how they work, how people can access them quickly and most importantly how they access those results really quickly. Now here at Anfield more used to football fans yesterday it opened as one of 18 test centres here in Liverpool. Some schools as well will be used of course consent will be obtained from parents for any youngsters that are tested but here there's been a big uptick as you say more than 23,000 people have been tested and in terms of people who've tested positive, it's 154. Now, that mightn't seem like a big number, but when you think about it, these are people without symptoms, people who were walking around not knowing that they had coronavirus. And the idea then is that they will now isolate. It will take that level, that risk of infection, out of the community here in Liverpool. We'll wait to hear a little bit more news if Nottingham will be next. All right, thank you very much. We'll be with you later. Thank you. Now, there's a warning this morning that the pandemic has caused most children in England to fall behind with their learning and for some, their social skills have also been impacted. Uh, that's according to the education watchdog Ofsted, which found some young children have forgotten how to use a knife and fork or have regressed back to nappies. Our education correspondent Dan Johnson reports. When the pandemic closed schools, we knew learning had paused to some degree. But now there's evidence many children went backwards even losing basic skills like using a knife and fork. Ofsted visited 900 schools, colleges, nurseries and social care providers over the last two months and found some older children have lost reading, writing and maths ability and there were signs of greater mental distress, including eating disorders and self-harm. The report describes three broad groups. The hardest hit young children have gone backwards, losing words and numbers, as well as some basic skills like potty training. The majority have slipped back to some degree, having lost school time and learning during lockdown. But there are some who've had a more positive experience, benefiting from more time with supportive families. 
The impact of the pandemic has combined with children's existing circumstances. And those with special educational needs have been especially badly affected. A third of schools have seen a rise in children being educated at home, which Ofsted says raises concern about their progress and well-being. The report highlights the continued hard work of teachers and says it's good schools and nurseries are open during England's current lockdown. The Department for Education said getting all children back into full-time learning was a priority, with a billion pounds being spent helping them catch up. Dan Johnson, BBC News. The government has a vow to overturn two heavy defeats inflicted on its Brexit legislation in the House of Lords last night. Yeah, peers voted to strip out controversial clauses from the UK Internal Market Bill that would enable ministers to break international law. Uh, let's speak to our political correspondent, Jonathan Blake, who is uh, in Westminster for us this morning. Uh, Jonathan, morning to you. So uh, is this now going to be put back in, do, do you think? Is that the next step? That's certainly the government's plan. The internal market bill, which is causing all this fuss, is, the government says, a way of ensuring free trade within the UK after January the 1st next year, when the transition period ends and EU trading rules and everything else ceases to apply. It also gives the government the power to override the withdrawal agreement, the international treaty, which it signed with the EU, setting the terms of Britain's exit. Hence, all this talk of the potential for ministers to break international law. Now, as you say, the House of Lords voted heavily in favour of stripping out those controversial clauses of this legislation last night. So a heavy defeat for the government there. Michael Howard, the former Conservative leader, one of those speaking out and voting against this legislation, saying that the government needs to think again. He's not the only one. The five former UK living prime ministers have also criticised what the government is doing here. And Sir John Major again said last night that these moves risk damaging Britain's reputation abroad. And for the first time in our long history, ministers have proposed legislation giving them powers to break the law. This is a slippery slope down which no democratic government should ever travel. Brexit may be even more brutal than anyone expected. The government sees it very differently. It says that when this legislation comes back to the House of Commons in December, it will reinsert these clauses and have another go at getting it through, describing them as a legal safety net to protect the integrity of the UK's internal market and the huge gains of the peace process. Of course, come December, the trade talks which are ongoing with the EU could have made progress and there could be a free trade deal in the works which would render these clauses largely irrelevant and that could change the debate entirely. OK, Jonathan, thank you very much for that. Living under tough restrictions has had, has had a huge impact on our lives and it is fitting that lockdown has been named Word of the Year by Collins Dictionary. The pandemic is the dominating theme in the top ten with phrases like key worker, self-isolate and social distancing. And Megastit, referring to the Duke and Duchess of Sussex stepping down from royal duties, also made the list. Wasn't, wasn't Brexit your word of the year last year? Was Probably, it wasn't it, yeah. <laughs> Brexit and then, what was it, lockdown? I can't remember what you said. Was Lo it I said lockdown. Was remember, lockdown. I was lockdown. Like, you mentioned all those other words. I've quite <laughs> forgotten already. <laughs> we are social distancing, remember that one? I know. Things, feels, that, we, I don't things think, that we didn't know. Remember, if you see old pictures or watch old footage where we used to sit... Right it feels, picture, it, it seems feels so weird. shocking, doesn't it? It does, yes. <laughs> Never again. Never again. <laughs>
One small jab for man is the headline in the Daily Mail, uh, which says scientists have hailed this giant leap for humanity. Uh, they're reporting that the dramatic announcement of the first effective COVID vaccine could see life return to normal by spring. The Daily Telegraph reports the NHS has plans to create 1,500 vaccination sites within weeks in anticipation of the rollout of the vaccine. And it's got a little um, graph there of who gets it first. Um, yeah, the priority list it mm. is. Yeah, and we'll take you through some of that, um, you know, some of the various details around the vaccine this morning. And also, uh, the Crown. Um, I know many of you are big fans of the Crown series. I think series four we're up to now. The historical drama about the royal family starts on Sunday, and the BBC arts editor Will Gompertz has awarded it four out of five stars. Lots of talk about Gillian Anderson, who plays Margaret Thatcher. Some people have given her amazing reviews. And other people say it's not quite up to scratch. I'm looking forward to seeing what it is. Oh, I'm just looking forward to it, aren't you? Yeah. Um, should we look at that? Look, there's the, there's the little graphic that tells you who, um, well, at this point, who um, is designed to get the jab first. Starts with older adults and residents in a care home and care home workers as well. And then it basically goes down in age group to all of those o over 50. And then it's the rest of the population. Priority, as it says, to be determined. Uh, how do you... Right, here's a question for you. I mean, I know it's not that important in the grand scheme of things, but the German company with Pfizer who've developed this vaccine, because yeah. uh, the Prime Minister called them BioNTech yesterday, and yeah. lots of other people are calling them BioNTech. So or BioNTech, BioNTech as well. <laughs> so which is it? Whatever you call them, this is the couple behind it all. Uh, there's a big pull out in the Daily Mail saying the couple who saved the world. Uh, let me tell you their names. is uh, Uga Sahin and his wife... I believe you pronounce it, Uslem. Um, these are the two people behind BioNTech or BioNTech, whatever you'd like to say. And uh, essentially, they've poured 10 months of their life into this. And um, they are set to make an awful lot of money out of it. They reckon they're going to be worth about three billion quid by the end of it all. But even on their wedding day, would you be? Three believe? billion. Three billion, yeah. Even on their wedding day, they went into, they spent time in the lab. So they are. Uh, dedicated and devoted to their research and uh, along with Pfizer they've developed this vaccine so very very impressive and there's obviously all sorts of other vaccines being developed around the world yeah. at the same time. This is an amazing story um, about uh, this is a helicopter and it's carrying a donor heart um, it crash landed on the roof of a hospital in Los Angeles and you can see the helicopter on its side people were very worried it's going to fall off the side of that um, and then they had to cut their way into the helicopter to retrieve this heart because the, the person needing the heart was waiting um, it was then given to a medic who then slipped on on debris from the helicopter and it all ends well. Drama. It all ended well. So the pilot was had minor injuries. Two people on board had reported no injuries, um, and the heart was successfully um, was taken to the person who needed it. Isn't that amazing? You would never, if you tried to write that for some sort of medical drama, they'd never believe you. Helicopter no. crashes. Doctor drop, drops heart. Got one little cute picture to Go finish off with. Okay, this is one of the entries in the Ocean Photography Awards 2020. Would you like to see some hugging penguins? Oh, come on! Have a look at these two little fellas. Come on, look at them. This is in Melbourne in Australia. Having a little cuddle really sweet, on a rock. See the headlines as they happen and watch BBC News live in the app and get the full story with bbc.co.uk forward slash news. Follow the story for all the latest with BBC News.